board members are present. Recording in progress. So, um, I, if you don't know who I am, one of the big things I am in my life is a veteran. I have 16 years, and I know I have fellow veterans in this crowd. Would you all join me in leading you in the Pledge of Allegiance as we honor tomorrow's veterans? Yeah, nice. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for indulging me. Welcome again to uh, the November meeting. Again, we have all of our board members present, along with Chief Ware. Um, our first real item on the agenda is to look at the uh, agenda for this evening and to make any additions, deletions, or corrections. The only addition I would like to make is on uh, what is that? Item number nine, one on the approval. Uh, of the family program. I would like to strike approval and change that to discussion. We are not going to approve anything tonight, but there will be a brief discussion about the Family Act. That's the only addition I would like to make. That's a good addition. Any, anything else? Any other additions? Hearing none, we will approve the agenda as presented with the addition of correction on item 9-2. Next item on the agenda is to review and approve the October 22 regular meeting minutes. Any discussion or any changes that are necessary? I have to make a motion to approve the minutes as presented. A second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. That takes us to. Director Woods, Financial Matters Report. Good. Are you ready, Chief? I am. We go on second. Just skip to I the second slide. There we go. Does it make sense to dim the lights up right here because I can't really see you? Just for a second. That'll stand up and come around. Okay, there. Thank you, and appreciate it. Okay, this first slide is these are going to be slides that you pretty much see every week, every month. Excuse me, not every week, every month. So there shouldn't be any real surprises in them. I'll just go over some things on each slide. At this point, overall year-to-date revenue is at 96% of the total budgeted revenue. There are contributors to that. Um, property tax revenue, which is our biggest contributor to this, we'll actually see a slide on that, um, is at 99% of their budgeted amount. Ownership taxes continue to strike favorably. Interest income, there are some advantages to that. To get having higher interest rates, right, Chief? Because we actually get money for our savings accounts. Um, a big contributor this month was we got a very large reimbursement of CERF revenue of like $558,000 in the month of October. So that actually brought our numbers up quite a bit. Next slide. Expenses, just like they have been all year, they're tracking below the budget in room. Keep in mind that we are linearly 83% through the year in October. And right now, overall expenses are at 63% of their budgeted amount. 
So we will expect expenses to come in below budget. Um, contributors to that were continued to be administration. We have a budget out there for legal expenses that probably will not come to fruition, which makes administration expenses a little less. Um, human resources, which I think we outsource, right? Uh, correct. We yeah, that is <coughs> under budget by quite a bit. And overall salaries are, are also under budget. So training is still well below the budgeted amount. We did have an uptick in October, the month of October, to the tune of about $26,000 for a, let's see if I can say this, rigging for a rescue class. Got it. Yay. That's kind of a tongue twister. So that came through in October. We will be actually billing portions of that to the other districts that participated in the class. There are about 18 people in the class. Um, surf expenses are under budget at about 71%. We did a catch-up of PPE for fire, um, but they're still on target to be pretty much on budget. So overall expenses are looking good. Next slide. So having overall expenses down, having revenue over budget, basically that's having a, a good impact on our bottom line. So we're at 1.942 million as of the end of October, whereas last year, to 2021, we were at 76, 776,000. So that's um, we're having a positive impact to the amount of money that we get to keep. Next slide. <coughs> so we're going to look at property tax revenue specifically because it's over 60% of our budget revenue amount. It's at 99% of its overall year-to-date budget. So basically we're at 3.66 million in actuals versus 3.647 budgeted. So you can't get a whole lot closer. We're like, I don't know, 400 and some dollars apart. So we did a, just a bang up job of forecasting property tax revenue. If anybody has any questions, please raise your hand. I'm happy to answer them. Next slide. We look at labor three different ways, like property yeah. tax. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, but so at the end of the year when you redo your budgets mm -hmm. and you see a discrepancy and you're, you've uh, brought in more money than you have budgeted for and spent less money than you budgeted for, what kind of adjustments will you make or will you? Well, we won't adjust the bottom line budget for this year. Right. We might move money in between because it's really not. Or will you go out buy a new fire truck? Or no, we're not going to go out and buy a fire truck. <laughs> that. At some point, we're going to have to buy a fire truck, but not right this minute. So what we do is we look at this year's budget, and I think actually on the agenda is 2023 budget. We will make adjustments to 2023 to accommodate some of the discrepancies that we saw this year. Okay. Answer your yeah. question. Okay. Cool. So we look at labor three different ways. We look at total labor adjusted for the amounts that we bill to Inner Canyon. Right now we have a lot of IGAs with Inner Canyon. Fifty percent of our maintenance wages are billed to them. Fifty percent of prevention services and one hundred percent of fuels crew services. So what this number represents and what seventy two percent, 70.7 percent of budget, is all of the adjustments taken out, which is how we forecast. So when we forecast 2023, we will take into account the amount of expenses that we bill to the other fire districts. Um, so that's that number. So we're at, I can't even read one, we're at um, 2.3. 316 million versus a budget of 2.58 million. So we're very, very close. Again, we're below budget, but we are tracking appropriately in terms of labor. Next slide. So now we look at labor, not only with the adjustments taken out for what we bill to the other districts, but we take out SURF. SURF is kind of a, an interesting individual. We, we get reimbursed. We, 
Owl Creek Fire gets reimbursed for our surf expenses, not just labor, but the other expenses involved. If we send equipment to an out of district fire, we get reimbursed for that. We get reimbursed for mileage for people driving to the out of district. So we bill the state for all of that. So what this represents is we've taken out the adjustments for what we bill the other districts, and we take out surf labor only in this case. So again, you can see that we are tracking below the forecasted amount. So again, these labor numbers adjusted for surf and um, the district expenses are looking good too. Next slide. So then we're going to look at just surf all by itself. You will see that we had we're at five hundred and thirty. $4,000 year to date for SURF for 62% of budget, which was 858000 So again, we're below budget for the amount that we are spending for the outer district fellows. Any questions? Am I making sense, I hope? Next slide. So, SURF reimbursement is very important to us because that's the 558000 of revenue that was the bump in October for SURF for the reimbursement. So if we look at this, we have, um, we've submitted a million two forty one eight oh six in SURF expenses. This time last year, we had submitted 885000 So we've actually submitted more in 2022 than we submitted in 2021 at this time of the year. Are you getting reimbursed? Okay, so the five hundred thousand we just got. What year was that fire? It's for this year. It's twenty two. It's for twenty twenty two. Yeah. In fact, I'll I'll sort of describe how that comes in in just a second if you'll hold that thought. So at this juncture, we've submitted more expenses to the state than we did in twenty twenty one. Surf reim. You want to hit the next return? Here we go. SURF um, reimbursed year to date is a million one ninety eight oh one five. So we've been reimbursed right now for almost ninety seven percent of what we have billed the state for, and that that's key because in twenty twenty one we didn't get all the reimbursements until twenty twenty two first quarter. So it, it's good if we can match this up a little closer than three or four months after we've actually incurred the expenses. So the SURF remaining to reimburse, which is the number down at the bottom, is $43,792. Those are all from October fires. So we are about 41 days um, delay between the time we bill the state and the time we get money back. Last month, we were 45 days between the two. Last year, we were like 60 three days. So the whole process is running a lot smoother than it did in 2021. Okay, hit the next return. There we go. Thank you. Um, 774000 is total surf expenses. So that includes the labor that we just looked at, the 534000 plus another 200 plus thousand of additional costs that we are reimbursed from the state. So just to give you guys an idea of why this is really important, we covered fires in Alaska during June and July. We covered fires in Arizona, one fire in Arizona during April and May. Colorado, we had one fire in June. California, we had fires in June. Idaho, we had fires in August through September. Nebraska, April, there was a fire in Nebraska. Nevada. It's called the Wildcat Fire. Good name, right? In July. New Mexico, there were, I think, about six fires that we covered through April, May, and June. Oregon, there were three fires that we helped with. Texas, there were multiple fires that we covered in April, June, July, August. Utah, July, we had a fire. Washington State, there was a fire that started in September, finished up in October. In Wyoming, we covered a fire in July and August. So, that is a lot of fires for us to cover, um, which is why it's, it is important for us to be able to do this. Next slide. Any questions? 
Any more questions? So you're saying our cost for the support for those fires, our actual out of pocket, was seven hundred fifty thousand. About seven hundred seventy-four thousand. Yes. And the rules but the reimbursement. We are reimbursed by the state for an all-in number, which includes benefits as well as gas money, equipment. All the expenses. Uh, the the backfill, so yes, it covers the backfill, it covers the firefighter that's on the incident as well as the backfill firefighter here. And then if an apparatus goes out, it covers the apparatus at an hourly rate as well. So that's why the amount we bill the state is higher than the expenses that we actually incur. Okay, last slide. October actual expenses were two hundred eighty-one thousand nine hundred and six dollars and one cent. I think that's what that says. I would like a motion to approve the October expenses, please, from the board member. Motion to approve <coughs> two hundred eighty-one thousand nine hundred six and one cent. Oh, thank you. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Between you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you All very right. much, and I'm, I'll be around if anybody has any more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dirk Woods. As so always. Welcome, Dirk Pixley. President. All right. President. That takes us into uh, Chief Ware's report. Mm. Trying to get the meeting back here. October was a relatively uneventful month for calls. Um, one thing I, would, I do want to talk about on my uh, message is, first off, I want to recognize firefighter paramedic Zach Neese. He's actually working today. He's on a call right now. But he just graduated from the St. Anthony's paramedic program. Uh, it's one of the first times we've sent somebody in the last couple of years that was successful. He did a great job in the program. He just finished up his internship. And on Monday, he passed his national registry. So he's going to be promoted the next pay period to firefighter paramedic, which is pretty exciting. Um, he had a number of challenges with the school. There were some changing, some changes at the school. The program should take six to seven months. It ended up taking literally up until Monday, and that was through no fault of his. He did an excellent job, and he's going to add one more ALS provider to the staffing. So congrats to him. Yet again, he's on a call. The next thing I wanted to talk about was uh, Lieutenant Jesse Weinfeld, um, who was sworn in a little while ago. Little background on Lieutenant Weinfeld. He was a volunteer here for 10 years. He's been in the fire service for 18. He's going to be promoted to our new training captain. Uh, he's been a ship lieutenant now for uh, about six months. And over the summer, he started handling training as a collateral duty. Um, he was doing an excellent job. And this month is an example of that. We ended up having a record number of training hours. Uh, we ended up with three classes with individuals from multiple agencies. I think we had five agencies that attended classes. He's also working with Platte Canyon and heading up the burn building project that we're a part of. Um, he has a number of new ideas and he's bringing a lot to the position. It's pretty exciting. He's going to shift off of the line staff to shift position next month and move over to a 40-hour work week. And then finally, Neil, we got the engine back. <laughs> Yesterday. It went in in February and we got it back, which was, it should be back in service, hopefully by next week. We got a, it was completely stripped, there was literally nothing on it, so the guys are putting it back in service and it works, which is pretty exciting. <laughs> Chief, for those that aren't familiar with the history. Oh, yeah, yeah, so I apologize. For those of you that aren't familiar, we, we had a fire in February, that's February, um, where unfortunately due to the, pro, the, the parking area, it was, it was a catastrophic fire, uh, suffered some catastrophic losses, but due to some roads, uh, problems, as well as parking area, the truck ended up suffering some pretty significant heat damage. Uh, melted the entire pump panel, a lot of the paint, pretty much anything rubber on the driver's side was melted or damaged. Um, and we filed an insurance claim on it, and full disclosure, was, there was no fault of the guy. They actually parked so close to the hill, you couldn't open the doors on that side trying to get away from it. And it was so icy, if they would have backed down, they just would have stacked it up and rolled it off a hill. The guys did everything they could to prevent the damage. It was unfortunately just due to some of the parking challenges that we have. 
Um, so we turned over to insurance, and there was another fire on New Year's Eve of last year that damaged, I think, 42 trucks on the front range. Uh, so our truck was behind them. There's only one or two truck vendors that repair fire trucks in the area. And uh, so there were a lot of challenges, but we finally got it back. And Neil has asked several times about it, and every time I don't have a good answer because they keep saying they're working on it. So finally, it's done, which is good. Yeah. Uh, operations in October, we had uh, 170 hours of volunteer staff hours. We averaged 3.6 members per call, which is up uh, three-tenths from last month. 23% of the calls overlapped, and our average response time was 8.30. Um, the, re the reason the average response time is down a bit is uh, most of the calls were along the corridor. We're along our main service area, so the response time, we didn't have any calls in the outlying areas, which usually <coughs> skew those numbers. Um, nothing remarkable about that. The only interesting thing is we did have a slight uptick in ambulance transports. We had 47 transports for 125 calls, which is a lot more than we've had in the past. I don't really know why. It's just a random number. Um, there's no real, no real rhyme or reason on it. Sometimes there are more. Uh, training, again, Jesse Weinfeld is moving to the training captain. Um, and th this is the big exciting part. Uh, firefighters had 1,464 hours of training log for the month. That's personnel hours in training and classes. It's a record training month. We've never had anything quite that big. I attribute that to Captain Weinfeld and the classes he's putting together. He spearheaded the Rigging for Rescue class. We also have a bunch of members in an EMT class at uh, Inner Canyon. We had a really interesting non-invasive entry class. It was essentially a lock picking class. And so people have asked, why, why do you do that? Why do you do that? When we have to go for a welfare check, uh, somebody calls a welfare check on somebody and the house is secured, or we have to get into a building for some reason or another, we, we have a lot of destructive techniques. We can get through. There, there are very few doors in the district we can't get through. Most time it creates a significant amount of damage. There's been a big push in the fire service in the last 10 years to become better at it. And one of the things, I went through a class about 10 years ago, and it was amazing. You could start, you, you know, there are a lot of ways. <laughs> Shove knives, all kinds of things you can do to get into these buildings without creating the damage, which is better for the taxpayer, especially if it's not an emergent situation. You know, us smashing the door down is, is not really acceptable. So we brought that class in. And we had, I believe, we had 36 people from Inner Canyon, Elk Creek, and Platte Canyon, and North Fork that came to the class. It was one of the most successful classes we had. It was pretty exciting. Um, and then we also had our regular company drill. So it was a big training month, and a lot of that's due to uh, Captain Weinfeld when he put it together. Uh, Zach Neese also completing paramedic school. Fire prevention, Fire Marshal Parker, he uh, completed 39 inspections for the month of October. And uh, the big news is the Schmiel engine is finally back after a very long trip down the hill. Uh, in wildland news, um, probably one of the biggest things is our community ambassador program is, is growing by leaps and bounds. We now have 35 ambassadors. There was an ambassador event last night that had 31 ambassadors. It's, it's a tremendously successful program, which is due to the fellow who's standing there, all there with his mustache and organizing and then our ambassador program. This has been the, it's probably one of the better programs that's been started up in the district in the last couple of years. It's amazing the amount of community engagement we have. So that's really successful. It continues to grow. We continue to have people asking about how do we be a part of it. So it's working out really well. The other big thing is uh, chipping is done. The final numbers for chipping, 480 residents were serviced. 3,575 piles were chipped and 900 cubic yards of biomass were removed, um, which is pretty tremendous. You know, we tried to cap it at 400, but as things go, you know, there's always more. Um, the guys did a great job on it. Uh, ben Moses, the one who leads the program, he really did a good job organizing it. It was a, a well-run program. We're still refining it, and we're probably going to refine it more for next year, but it, it worked. It was a success. Um, the module, they pretty much spent the uh, last month here working on saw projects. Um, fire season pretty much stopped at the beginning of October. It was a ground to a halt, and so everybody just kind of concentrated on some project work. Uh, Glen Elk is almost done with the sh uh, fuel break up on the high side of Glen Elk. Now they're moving to the defensible space around the uh, cabin area. And then the last day of work for the seasonals was... Uh, October 28th.
And that's all I have. Any questions for the chief? Thanks, chief. Thanks, Ben. And um, please pass on our, our congratulations to, to not only uh, Captain Weinfeld, but also our new paramedic. Yeah, I was hoping you'd be here because you'd be real uncomfortable about it. <laughs> yes. I'm stuck on a, a transport. Okay. <laughs> That's he uh, probably did. What, that I was going to say, Ken pointed out he probably volunteered for the transport, and he probably did. <laughs> All right, we'll move into old business. The first item in old business will be addressing the motion made last month for us to spend up to $160,000 on the SCBA purchase. We are going to make an emo I'm going to ask for a motion to amend the previous motion from. 160,000 to 180,000. And Chief, I would like you to give some clarity to the board mm -hmm. and to our of uh, course. constituents on the rationale behind that. Um, I was waiting for a bid from the vendor. That 160 number was was my number. Um, and once we got the board, well, once we got the bid from the vendor, the actual bid was 178, mm -hmm. 640 something or other. Yeah, 186. Um, um, yeah. 100, oh, the actual was approved was 160,000. Yeah, it was 160,000. For those of you who don't know, we received a grant for new SCBAs and it covered up to 20 SCBAs. Our SCBAs are outdated, they're 2008. Recommended end of life is 10 years. Obviously, we've stretched that a little further than we probably should have, but they're, they're a pretty costly item. Um, we ended up putting in for a grant and we received a grant which covered 20 new SCBAs. Problem is, ours are so old, there, there's no interoperability with the current models that we have and the new ones. Um, and it's, it's not safe for firefighters, nor is it a good idea to have two items. Uh, for those of you who don't know this, that, it's a self-contained breathing apparatus. It's the air packs that you see firefighters wearing when they go into an environment that's immediately dangerous to life and health. So we needed to purchase more. Uh, we were looking long term, we were looking at some lease purchase, or it's going to be a big purchase down the road. Uh, but with this grant, you know, we have the money in reserves, and so I asked the board to spend for that motion to purchase them, um, but I was a little short. So that's why we came back. We got the bid from the vendor, and... Uh, so the new bid was um, $18,646 more than what we had approved. Correct. So I asked one of my board, uh, fellow board members to make a motion to amend the previous motion for us to spend up to $180,000, which would give us around a, a $1,400 buffer, just under fourteen, dollars um, in case there are any final changes. And if, if you would like, I'll read the motion from last month. The motion read, um, uh, that it was, we were awarded a health and safety grant to purchase 20 units of SCBA. The current models need replacement, all units to be replaced at the same time. The motion was made to approve up to $160,000 to purchase the balance of the SCBA fleet. Uh, this was um, made by Director Newby and seconded by Director Woods. So I would ask to amend that motion to spend up to 180000 so we will increase that by 20000 You want to take I make a motion to amend the previous motion to allow spending of up to $180,000 for SCPA uh, equipment. Can I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, perfect. That amendment to the motion passes. The next item is the 2023 budget. Do you, do you want to knock this out, or do we want to have Chief Aronson come up as well? I was going to say, I can, I, can, I can do it. It's a, it's a relatively... So, this year, um, it's, it's a relatively flat budget. Uh, when we got the... So, first off, I'll start with, you know, this budget is a prediction. We don't have any of the final numbers yet. In August, we get a preliminary tax valuation for our district, and we build our budget off that. December, the first week in December, we should get our final numbers. It's most of the time, it's pretty close. Sometimes it's a little bit less due to uh, some uh, changes of taxes and some protests and that sort of thing. 
but it's pretty close. Uh, this year, uh, the valuations came in less. Um, our budget's going to be down about $70,000 um, from last year. So our tax revenue uh, going into this year will be 3.846625. Um, and with a flat budget, we're not making any big changes. There, the, there are no program expansion changes um, moving into this year. The only things we're going to be doing that are really different, we're going to be adding two positions. We're going to be adding a permit full-time fire marshal. Um, I talked about that at the last board meeting. We, our fire marshal right now, Roger Parker, is a linchpin in our organization, and he's on his third career. Our fear is one day he's going to decide that he wants to go to the beach or play golf instead of be a fire marshal, and it would be a challenge. Um, he's spent, I believe he's been a fire marshal for over 40 years, and it's critically important to bring somebody on to pick his brain and learn from him. So the goal is to bring on a perfect full-time fire marshal to shadow Fire Marshal Parker for the next probably year, year and a half, and then have that roll into being that position. Um, the other position we're going to add is a service mechanic to assist our fleet manager, Adam Hojanowski. It's part of the maintenance program we stood up this year. It's going very well. Um, but yet again, with everything else, Adam's only one person. Uh, he is a shared position with Inner Canyon, and we're bringing North Fork into the shared position as well. And with, between the three agencies, we're right around 60 pieces of rolling stock. And one of the characteristics that we all share is our rolling stock is not new. So it does need a little more maintenance. So we're going to bring in a service mechanic to assist Adam. Those are the two positions we're going to create for the uh, for 23. So is that a full-time position? Too? Correct. Yeah, that, that'll be a permanent full-time position uh, to benefit it as well. Uh, and then the other, I guess, big change we're going to do is uh, in capital. Capital is going to be, you'll, you'll see it's a lot lower than we had before. Last year, we tried to earmark all of our big expenses. Um, and some of it didn't come to fruition, so it kind of looked like we left, you know, we left money sitting there. We had the $550,000 that we were going to put towards Inner Canyon's station for some of the, to share the cost on that since we're going to be using a lot of it. They weren't able to break ground with it, so it's sitting there, it's going to roll over. In talking with Chief Aronson, and then I mentioned this to uh, Director Woods and Director Pixley, what I'd like to do for next year is, instead of earmarking all of those large purchases, I think it makes more sense just to, our, our capital is going to have some smaller purchases in it, and then as, as things come up, if something does come up, we'll come to the board and I will ask the board if they would approve spending those monies. Uh, to me, it just makes a little more sense than trying to earmark all these things that may or may not happen next year. So for capital, what we have right now, we are going to need a new ambulance. We purchased one. I believe two years ago, uh, through a grant, we're gonna try and get the grant again. It's a 50-50 grant. Ambulances are getting obscenely expensive. The last one we bought was, believe it or not, $250,000 for an ambulance, and that was two years ago. We're gonna have to buy a new power cot, which is the, the bed, the pram that we put patients on, and those are about $25,000. So we are going to try and put $300,000 in the budget for an ambulance, which in this day and age, I guess it's normal, but it seems almost obscene. Like 10 years ago, you could buy a fire engine for 300000 But So we've got, uh, we're going to do 300000 for an ambulance in capital. For fleet, um, we are still purchasing some of our maintenance things to upgrade and stand up our maintenance program. We're looking at some vehicle lists and a couple other items. And then in wildland and prevention, we're going to be buying one more command vehicle. And... Uh, then we're going to be looking at facilities. We're going to do some infrastructure improvements, some remodeling. Uh, one of the things that uh, Director Newby brought up is making some of the stations a little more comfortable for remote workspaces, et cetera. Some of our stations are not, they're a little dated, if you will. It's um, a nice way to put it. Uh, they just haven't had any money spent on them in a long time. The work has been done by volunteers that want to help so it's been I mean we've had furniture from Habitat for Humanity that sort of thing which is okay but they're not really comfortable workspaces so uh, we're going to spend some money to upgrade the office space at station three and station four um, yeah and so that's those are the big changes that we're doing the rest of the budget it being as it is without big changes it's going to remain relatively the same rolling into 23.
Perfect. And the process will work as this. Next month, we will have a final, a final version of the 2023 budget, which the board will um, approve yep. as we move forward. And there's still going to be some tweaks on this. This is, right now, this is a draft version. We still don't even have our final numbers from the county. Usually there are some small changes. We also don't have our numbers from uh, our liability insurance. When we met the insurance guy, he said they expect a 15 to 20% increase, mm -hmm. which was a lot, but he couldn't tell us what it would be. So we're, we're erring on the high side with a lot of these. A lot of these numbers could change moving in. They're not going to be drastic changes, but it's not set in stone quite yet. Over the next month, we're going to be making some tweaks and some final adjustments with it. So I, I'll just add one thing. We actually met today to discuss some the more detail of the budget, and I had a number of questions because I always have questions, and Chief answered them to my satisfaction. So I think the, the budget draft that we have right now is good. Any other questions for Chief Ware or for our esteemed treasurer, Director Woods, in regard to the 2023 draft budget. All right, that will take us to uh, Director Wagner and Director Newby and the Outreach Committee update. We're moving forward on the website, it's looking great, and we are starting to populate it, and um, we just did some stuff later this end of this week, so well, that's about it. that's about the update. It's looking great. It's coming along. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. Sharon, would you like to add anything? I know that you've been instrumental in this as well. I have a goal of getting it up at the beginning of December. We'll keep our fingers crossed. December one. Um, no, the early the next <laughs> the next launch date is two weeks after November twenty first. So whatever that Monday is, cool. is the next go live dates for for our websites. So it's every two weeks. So there's November twenty first, and then two weeks after that. So if we can hit that date, um, we can announce it in December. Awesome. Is that the fifth? That is the fifth. Okay. Thank you. And for those that aren't familiar, this has been an issue uh, not only amongst the board, but also amongst our, uh, our very important constituents who have addressed that we needed to have more outward facing and communication to ensure that everybody is getting what is the information that not only what we are taking on here as a board, but what Chief Ware and Chief Aronson and Barb and everyone else is performing and behind the scenes so that everybody's more informed. So this is an exciting time that the Outreach Committee has moved quite quickly, mind you, um, just this year to be able to, since May, I think May or June, when we created this subcommittee to get this going. So thank you all for that effort. All right, the next item in old business is a Consolidation Committee update. Chief, we had talked to you today about providing everyone just a brief update, and then we will um, hit any other highlights. Yeah, I can do that. Um, I think, as everybody knows, this has been a, a, a project for quite some time. Um, we're finally starting to move forward after the approval of the vendor for the market research. Uh, the survey is getting close to being done. Uh, the board representatives from all the districts are doing it's actually, a, the, the last meeting we had was tremendous. It was, there was a lot of dialogue, uh, and it's, it's working out really well. This, the survey right now, the, the board members are finalizing the questions and working with turn four, and the goal is to try and get it out here in the next week or two. Um, and the that's first pretty, phase, correct, Chief, the first right? phase. Yeah, the first phase. And so all that is is the, the research to see what the constituents of the district think of A, us, and what the project looks like. Um, what if, if they would support consolidation, talking about consolidation and some facts about it. And that's going to dictate what we do with anything else. You know, if, if people are not in favor of consolidation of fire departments, not in favor of better service, that's, that's totally fine. That's going to dictate and we'll pump the brakes on it and what we'll have is we'll just do a lot more IGAs. But for the first phase, that's where we're at. Hopefully it's going to launch 
we're going to say in the next week or two, 14th two weeks, of November, something like that. Yeah. And so that, that's kind of where it's at. We're still working on a lot of administrative alignment uh, between the districts. Uh, the, the fleet maintenance has been a really big thing. It's, it's working out really well uh, across all three districts. Um, I know Chief Rogers in North Fork is pretty excited. He was using Evergreen before. Um, if anybody knows where Trumbull is, uh, driving from Trumbull to the Evergreen maintenance shop is been a fire engine is about an hour and 45 minutes. And now we're going to have a fleet mechanic with a service truck that can actually go to the stations to provide service. It's going to save a tremendous amount of time. Um, Chief Aronson and myself have spent, I don't know how many hours, shuttling vehicles around. It, it, it's working out real well. Um, the next big step we're going to try and make is do, do some administrative alignment. We're going to start getting our district administrators together. We're going to start looking at payroll companies, what everybody's using, and what's going to be the most efficient to move to. Um, so that's kind of where, where we are with it. Sharon, did you want to add anything? Um, do you want to say something about Shirley's um, questions in her survey? Oh, yeah. We, uh, uh, the Conifer Area Council, uh, we did, so they, when Shirley Johnson, if everybody knows, she sent out, uh, they worked on their uh, survey for the Conifer Area Council. They do that every so often. And the chiefs, we actually approached her and asked if we could throw a question in there about the consolidation. Hopefully everybody's taken the survey. It's important as residents to take the survey and give feedback. Um, but we were able to put a question or two in there about it. And Shirley had said that some of the results right now are 90% positive about consolidation efforts, which, which is pretty interesting. You know, it's Hopefully it's telling. Um, so that was kind of exciting. You know, we'll, we'll be interested to see what that looks like compared with the uh, survey that we're doing. Obviously, the one we're doing is very specific, but uh, it is promising. It's a lot more detailed with more questions. Yeah, significantly, yes. So how does the commission survey, or not the commission, or the council? Shirley's? The Conferry Council? Yeah, how is hers distributed? I, I can answer that. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. a lot of ways. Yeah, a lot of ways. I mean, it's word of mouth in some cases, but if you go to a town council meeting, they have a sign-up sheet, and you put your name and your email address, and then they email to you about upcoming events and things like that, and one of the things they email to you is the survey, the link to the survey. So if you need it, let me know, because I have the link. I can send it to you. Yeah, and then they, they share it a lot. Um, I just forward it to most of my friends via email. Yeah. Um, the important piece is that the survey we're doing is a professionally driven, yes. Yes. pushed yes. survey That's, that has to get over 400 responses before it becomes a valid survey. Exactly. Yeah, yes. and it's, it's by a professional survey firm that actually, this is what they do. So it's a push out. data collection. I mean, it is, it is a push driven by... Yeah. Addresses that they get, not not mail addresses, but phone, email, correct. Text. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's yeah. geofencing <clears throat> specific to this area versus the kind of area council one is. Whoever random. shows up. It, yeah, it, 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 it's random. <laughs> yes. But, but the interesting thing is that um, this particular firm, I mean, they do this for a living, right? So they have access to areas that they can get people's numbers. And email addresses, and because they can get it from uh, databases where they can, if they know your address, they can tag that with your email address if they have it. So there's a lot of, they have a lot more proficiency at getting people's email addresses than a sign up sheet. So. so, do we get to see the questions, or do, do the, does the public get to see the questions that are being pushed out? What What is the sort of process going? That, that's, that is exactly what happens, um, Director Nagy, is that they have access to phone numbers, emails, things like that. And so the survey will be sent to that. People are allowed to share that. In other words, if I get a survey, I can share that link with you or with Kent or whomever. So it goes out to as many people as they can send it out to in the, the geo region. I don't so so what, what questions are they asking? Well, they start out with... Um, I mean, ha have, you, have you seen, is there a list of yeah, questions? I see, yeah, the, all the people in the committee have been over 
the list of questions. We've asked them to remove some questions. We've asked them to clarify some things that are in there. So we've all had physical contact with a list of questions and have vetted out what seems to be. So can you can you give us the board and the general public a general idea of, of the approach that they're taking? Um, it's I can't give you the specifics yet because they haven't sent it out yet. So just in general, just in, in general. Oh, in general, it, it it basically starts out with um, probably have it on my laptop. It starts out with you know, it's anonymous, right? So you don't identify who you are. But, but you you're gonna give like your your sex, your your age range. Um, there's there is there's your address. What, your there's no your address. There's um. What political party are you? Mm -hmm. Are you Republican, Democrat, other, or unaffiliated kind of thing? So basic kind of questions that you would see on a survey. Um, age range. So there's like five ranges of age in terms of you identify your age range. You identify um, male, female, or identify otherwise. Yeah. Right. Um, because you can't. You have to ask that now. Um, so there's like there's like I'm gonna say seven or eight basic questions before they get into specific questions about the consolidation itself. Can you give us an idea of what, what questions, I mean, how are the questions posed? The questions uh, are the specific to each or? district. So one of the things they want to know is what district are you in? Do you know what district you're in? Like, I know I'm in Oak Creek, but we're not sure that 100% of the people out there know what fire district you're in. Because when you want a fire truck or an ambulance to show up, you call 911, right? And that gets directed to whatever district you're in. So one of the questions is, do you know what district that you're in? Hang on. Oops, wrong kind of thing. Bear with me a second, because you've got to find it. So while you're doing that, is there a, a committee then that is studying and doing the planning for this merger? Um, yes. Full-time staff. Uh, well, we, we have a committee that's made up right now between the three districts. Uh, we have two board members from each district board as well as the fire chief, and they're on this committee. Right now, where we're at, so the fire chiefs, we've been living it now for probably three years. It's, it's we functional. Well, we've been exploring what this looks like. Um, and then, yeah, through IGAs and this sort of thing, we've, we've been doing a lot with it. And then, a year ago, I, no, more than a year ago, it was more, yeah. it was more than a year ago, we started getting uh, these board members together to, to get this committee together to start really exploring it and actually seeing what it looks like. And then, the pandemic hit, and then it all came to a screeching halt at best. Um, we tried some Zoom meetings, which was awful. And so, about a year ago, we were able to get when we got back to face to face. That's where this committee really started going, and kind of we're we're going at a phased process to see if it's even feasible. So the first step we did, two a little over a year ago, we hired a consultant to do studies of all of our districts to see if it was feasible. This consultant came up with a report. It's about two hundred and seventy some odd pages with an overview of all the districts and if if consolidation is going to provide better service for the taxpayers. That consult that report said yes. You know, there's professional service, that's what they do. So then we took that and then this committee stood up and now so the next step is to get the idea of the taxpayers to see what all the residents think. You know, so that's kind of where we're at now. We're we're trying to get the survey out. The the goal is to get it out to hopefully every address within the three fire protection districts to get feedback from the taxpayers to see what they think of it. So you're setting them a set of questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then with that then is a brief synopsis in highlighting what the key facts are? Well, it, or you're just asking them questions? The, the, the firm will basically do an analysis of what they get. Like, you know, you had, we had 400 respondents and 
200 of those were between 65 and 70. Okay, well, so I'm just saying, you're going to actually give us if you sent me a survey asking me questions about consolidation of fire districts, mm -hmm. what basis of information do I have to answer those questions? Exactly. So and that's what we're trying to gauge that? is because there are some people that have participated in uh, board meetings for years that have heard the conversation about this. Then there's some people that are not participants at the board meetings and are unfamiliar with it. Then there's people anywhere in between those two ranges. So our goal is to find out who knows what and what do they know so that we can see how to move forward with the, this question of consolidation. Some of the questions, the draft questions, uh, I think it's all right for us to provide some. I think so. I, mean, yeah. Yeah. I don't see why not. I mean, it's well, not a yeah. private yeah. thing. So yeah. This is very benign, just for us to get started. Mm -hmm. They want to know if, what you think about your fire risk in your community. Yeah, is it increased, decreased? They want to try to get a gauge of what an individual who is responding to the survey actually has an awareness of, of their own um, risk within their community. They want to know what the concern for wildland, forests, and open space grass fires. Is it a big concern? Maybe somebody that's familiar with the Marshall Fire has uh, a better awareness of what our liabilities are in our environment. Or maybe it's somebody that is, is just unfamiliar and said, I, you know, I guess it's okay, it's not. Whatever it is, we want to see where those, um, where those opinions lie. Another question, do you believe the following statement is true or false? The number of volunteer firefighters has decreased over the last five years. Now anybody that's participated in one of our board members knows that volunteer fire, um, firefighters' availability is decreasing. And it's not just Elk Creek, it's not Conifer. It's nationwide. We are seeing a marked decrease in the amount of time people have available to provide service to their community through a volunteer fire department. Some people don't know that, and they might not be aware. So we're trying to get, an, again, a gauge of what the community's educational knowledge is and what their awareness of um, their own fire service is. The chief has said it before. Some people don't even know that Elk Creek Fire Protection District provides first in fire protection for their home. They just It's just not something that they're aware of. So if we can find out where those limits are, what the wide range of knowledge is, we will be better served to allow these industrial psychologists who are creating the next phase, or this phase and the next phase, to be able to see, is this a valid approach for us? Is this going to be worth the effort that we have been dedicating for the last two years, um, or as the chief just mentioned, are we just going to call it a wash? We are seventy-one hundred dollars into this so far, not including the initial survey that we did a year and a half ago, two years ago, with the the people to see how consolidation would improve your mice uh, protection and safety as a community, and we want to see if this is something that we can take to the, the community. But there's a list of questions that are in draft phase right now right. that are, we're going through. Um, it asks you things like, um, do you wonder, I think you just mentioned that, do you understand the wildland fire risk in our area? I, mean, I, I do, just because I've studied it for the last umpteen years. And Conifer and Aspen Park are like in the highest percentile of, of wildfire risk in the entire country. Okay, we're like, used to be Paradise, California was number one, we're number one. So we want to find out, do people know that? And is it, does it make a difference to you? In other words, would you support a ballot issue about consolidation knowing the different things? So it asks you, do you know this? And would this drive you to support a ballot issue on consolidation? Because if we go forward with this, it has to be on the ballot. It is something that the community will vote on. It's not done in a vacuum. It's like we don't wave a wand and say, here we go, we're consolidating. It has to be approved by the community. One of the questions addresses specifically each fire district's mill right. and what those concerns are. Now, I know that uh, Neil Whitehead has worked very hard to help us get that last mill passed when we went to the, the people in November of 21, when, when they did it. Right, 19. 
18. Yeah. 18. So 18. one of the questions is just what what is their awareness? The individual taking the the surveys. What is your awareness of the pill? Did you know that? Um, um, let me see. For voters that are currently live in Elk Creek, the ballot question would in, would increase the current fire district mill from twelve point six. Is this or twelve to sixteen? This would cost a homeowner about one hundred and twenty-one dollars annually, or ten dollars a month. Is this something you would be interested in? It just helps educate and ask some questions at the same time. So, Inner Canyon has a very similar question, as does North Fork. Goes on to um, ask other questions. Um, if uh, here's a question I like: the three fire districts combined make up four hundred square miles of some of the highest risk fire or wild, wildfire areas in the state. Knowing this, would you support the three fire districts getting together? Would you support your, um, whatever it is, they go through a list. So this, they say that the survey will take 10 minutes. I think it would take me a little bit more as involved as some of the questions are because uh, maybe I'm a little more intuitive than others or a little more interested. But basically, to, that's what it, it boils down to. And we can go through some of the draft things with, but to throw like the, the question, I think we had some questions around the mill um, stuff and how that was going to be phrased. So that's the, the, the draft questions that we have right now are coming to the finalized, um, the finalized question that will be sent out here shortly. But go ahead. And I think one of the things that there, there's education in here, there's words in here that educate the person that's taking the survey on how to answer, not how to answer the question, but what the question means. So, um, we were talking about, it. one of the things that I think people need to understand is that consolidation, while there are some administrative savings, you know, you have the same software, you have the same payroll system, you use the same attorneys, you use the same resources, there are some costs to this consolidation to the citizen. And that has to do with the fact that we would, the fire departments would be able to provide more services. So the, instead of um, three different dispatch systems, it would be one. So any ambulance that was on its way back up the hill from dropping off a patient, since we're all, it would all be on the same dispatch system, that ambul ambulance could be redirected to another transport if needed. Right now, it's a little complex because we're on three different dispatch systems. So the idea is the quality of service is going to be raised with the extra mills. We would be able to actually hire permanent full-time firefighters, EMTs, paramedics, as opposed to relying on volunteers. So there is some cost associated with the consolidation, but with that cost comes increased services. So are we, in the survey, does the survey contemplate a raised mill levy? Yes, it yeah, does. So that's one it of goes, the questions. That's so the questions one, of the, you... one of the questions is if the mill levy ballot question is passed, it would allow a newly consolidated district to provide more training opportunities mm -hmm. to both paid and volunteer, and to its volunteers. Knowing this, uh, are you more interested in the consolidation to take place, less interested those type of answers. So, but if the mill levy increase were to pass next November, the Consolidated Fire Protection District will be able to cover increased costs for fire safety equipment and medical instruments. In doing so, the district would be able to serve the population and have better response times. Knowing this, does this have any, do you have any interest? They're, they're still trying to determine how those answers will come. But so, so we are telling the voters that if we consolidate, a condition of consolidation is is a raise in their tax. Uh, no, have to have is it increased taxes? No. 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 What, what, are we, what are we actually saying? I so that's a we're given scenarios. So what we talked about, and originally, you know, so what the consultants talked about is we could do the inclusion exclusion. We could all all the boards could vote to merge tomorrow, and we'd all go to the lowest millennium. 
that was the first recommendation from the consultants. And all the chiefs felt, you know, I don't think that's appropriate. We all agreed that's not appropriate to the taxpayers where we just wakes up and, hey, you have a new fire department because yeah. we thought so, you know. Um, and so the ability question, what we, what we talked about in what I think is going to come back, I think people are going to be in favor of the consolidation. I don't think anybody's going to be in favor of increasing abilities. That's fine. You know, the consolidation does not hinge on a levy lift. What, what we need to do is figure out, because all three of us have different levies, and if we're going to all go to the lowest one, which is 12.3, 12, 12, I thought it was 12.3, 12, something like that, or do we go to the highest one, which is 14, something like that? And we didn't even want to put these on there, but the, the, the survey firm said it's critically important just to gauge the interest of the people. You know, there, there is no question in there, and we were very specific that the, the consolidation does not hinge on increasing the levies. But they said it's, it's almost a lost opportunity if you're going out to reach out to all these people just to gauge the interest in what people think of all of it. And there's different scenarios in here. It says, right. would you support a yeah. 3.5 mil increase, yes or no? And then based on your answer to that, it takes you to a second question, or it doesn't. So if you don't approve of 16 mils, would you approve 14 or something like that? So there's different scenarios to gauge what the community is has an appetite for. Because there, this, it costs money to run fire departments. Um, there's a, a, an example in here that says, five years ago, a pumper truck was $600,000. Now it's like a million dollars. So there's a big cost differential between five years ago and now. And so part of the education is knowing that, would you support a mill levy increase for your fire departments? So it's more just research. The, the consolidation does not hinge on a levy right. list. Uh, I want to make that perfectly clear. That's Doesn't. not what it hinges on. But well, but it, does, it, it does hinge on voter approval. Yes. yes and, it does. and my concern is that if we position this uh, improperly or incorrectly, we're going to turn off the voters. We're going to decrease their appetite. I agree. For uh, for consolidation, even if a consolidation were uh, absolutely what we should be doing, I I'm concerned that the messaging and the positioning is is. Um, <coughs> Is neutral, and that we are able to to actually get information from the public that is sensitive to having their taxes raised. I, I if if you look at in, in this election, all of the mill levy increases all went down I, yes. by the voters. Mm -hmm. So voters have no appetite, and and unless and until they and understand how their tax dollars uh, are being well spent now, mm -hmm. and any additional bill would improve their service dramatically, mm -hmm. then I, I think they would probably vote no. And that's, that's why we wanted to hire a professional firm that does that, to make sure that the messaging is correct with that. You know, I, I think it's critically important to have that message out there that this consolidation does not hinge on increasing taxes. And, and this, this, the survey questions don't don't say you have. There's two different questions. The question: Would you approve a consolidation because of this, this, or this? The mill levy questions are separate, and they are not the actual approval that we're searching for on the consolidation does not hinge. Mm -hmm on the mill levy increase. But we still need to gauge from the public if there is any sort of appetite for a mill levy increase, and, and how much. Because there's different levels. Or if none. Or none. Or if none. Yeah, or none. And it, it could come back and everybody says, yeah, consolidation sounds really good, but we could get back with, but we don't want our taxes raised. We don't want a mill levy increase. And with Which is great. Like, that's that's, that's yeah. the data we need. That's yeah. what we need. Then we know. Yeah. Then we know. There's a lot of if thems in there. And once we get the final draft, I'll, I will be happy to show it with you. But we're wanting those industrial psychologists to finalize with the recommendations from the three departments, committees that are represented, 
representing on this um, consolidation group. Is that answer your question? That was a long answer to uh, <clears throat> it, it tells me where we're at. Okay. Okay. Which is we want to get a survey out. So <laughs> before the survey comes out, okay, who's gonna review it to make okay, this is it, or no, we need to tweak it here or there. How that's we're doing that right now. Okay. So you know, my, I guess my concern is how many people will it actually go out to? Um, you know, I've seen numbers like four or five hundred people. I don't think that's even close to being enough. It, it'll go out to more than okay. four or five hundred people. And how but, how is it decided on how that gets distributed? Who? That's what this marketing okay. firm. This is what do. the yeah, Magellan. The survey Magellan firm is survey a firm. professional survey firm. That's what they do. Right. All right. So the key really is, is that they have to get to a certain, to get to a level of validity, they have yeah. to get at least, oh, yeah. so the lowest level is 400. Yeah. And I guess you to get to 400, they're going to blanket this entire, the, the entire district to yeah. even get those. The challenge is going to be to get those responses. I mean, I'm in agreement that normal citizen of any neighborhood, not just this one, is, has no idea mm -hmm. um, what it takes okay. to operate a, any department. Fire department or whatever it might be, yeah. they just don't. Um, so that's that's the challenge, I think, is having people understand the question. Well, the other side of that is they know what your property tax bill is, and yeah. they're making an assumption about the service that they're getting for their money. And so, if you say we're going to consolidate because this is going to make us more effective in our response, I'm like, yes, and. What is more effective equal? Oh, and it's going to be less expensive to operate. Well, good, because right there you just set my expectation that my property tax bill ain't changing. Oh, and guess what? The assessor just sent me my new assessment. The year 12 mills is now worth X percent more than it was last year, so isn't that enough money? Right? So I, I worked at state government for 10 years. I get it. Mm -hmm. It's how you word things and how you set mm -hmm. expectations mm -hmm. about this. I'm also 24 years in the Army. So I'm looking at this, where's the course of action analysis? You had a course of action analysis that took the mill levy to 16, and we did all kinds of funky things, and then you said, you have a course of action where we're just merging administratively at the same cost. Okay, great, so what are the facts and assumptions to each of those course of actions that we would have to make an argument to the taxpayer for. So we're sending out a survey, so that looks like we're on a fact-finding mission stage. Yes. Of where that, that's where that's we are. That's exactly where In, we are. Depending on how this turns out, that's going to that's gonna direct us for everything else. Right. You know, and I mean, all the chiefs have agreed, you know, if the taxpayers don't want this, then we pump the brakes on the whole thing. That's that's totally fine, you know. Well, or you, you figure out we need to launch a public information. Exactly. That, right. You know, I, I think a lot of this. It's going to be interesting to see what people think because I, I agree. Most people have no idea what what your fire department is. You know who it is. They and it's you know. Nine one one and everything happens. Well, yeah. You call and somebody shows up. It doesn't matter. Paid volunteer. What color your truck is? Whatever. As long as somebody shows up. Yeah, so that's where we're at. It's essentially fact-finding right now, and then that's going to lead us to the next step, wherever it goes. Yeah. This is phase one. The Definitely very first phase, phase one. as we mentioned, we're trying to find out what we don't know yet. Yeah. All right, that was a nice yeah. conversation, uh, yeah. robust conversation, and there will be more to, more to come, for sure. Moving out of old business, we will move into new business. This first item is to approve our 2023 auditing services. As most of my board, my fellow board members know, but perhaps the public does not, we are using an auditing firm called the Adams Group. They have been our auditing firm for a number of years, and they are specific to our, the needs of the, um, the district. And we are looking at continuing with the Adams Group to continue with our auditing services in the future. So 
to approve the 2020, well, actually, I said 2023. I erred. They will be auditing everything that Ms. Woods was talking of a little bit ago and what Chief Aronson and Barb have been working on with uh, Chief Ware. They're going to be working on the 2022 audit. And to do so, we need to get an approval to um, have an audit engagement letter. Um, so we can discuss this a little, a little bit more in depth. Could I get a motion to approve the Adams Group for the 2022 auditing services for Elk Creek Fire Protection District? Director Pixel. Yes, sir. So moved. Second. Second. All right, perfect. Um, now, discussion on the motion. As I mentioned, uh, they, they have been specific to our needs. They have a specialty in terms of what they do, and they do very well um, as compared to some auditing groups that we have had in the past. So this motion is really just procedural, just to ensure that we are continuing with the same process we have had in the past. Any other discussions on that for uh, my board members? All right, perfect. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion um, to approve the Adams Group for the 2022 auditing services. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, that motion passes. The next item of new business is the State's Family Act, the Family Medical Leave Insurance Act. Now this, for those that are unfamiliar, and uh, it's so new, a lot of us are still trying to get familiar to familiarity with it, um, is to help those who do not have a robust health care service plan, either where they work or if maybe they're in a landscape company and they don't provide health care services. Most often, you will find organizations, large organizations, respect, uh, that respect the intent of their employees to have a pretty substantial health care program for their employees in terms of insurance. We have that for our employees here at the uh, at, at Elk Creek. The, the discussion of the family program is needed though because unless you opt out, you are automatically opt in. And that means that the coverages that we have for our employees now could actually be diminished in terms of what their, their care is. Now, we are waiting for final determination from legal, but it's um, we will probably have that back for the next board meeting. Is that correct, Chief? Yes. So that we can yeah. approve a board. Um, I will be asking the board to make a motion to opt out of the Family Act once we get all of our facts in line so that we can continue with the same coverages we have for our employees. But the reason we need to have this discussion is because if... Uh, we have to post to the employees the process that is in place for us to opt out so that the employees have an opportunity to voice any concerns or to get a better understanding. We're just not going to spring it on them and say, nope, no, no, um, no health care for you. So um, that is the reason we are having this discussion. Perhaps some of the business owners on the board uh, are familiar with the Family Act. And would like to talk. It What's that? <laughs> so I'm diving into it right now. <laughs> okay. So the discussion is basically the need for us as a board to have an understanding that we are going to need to post this 15 days before we have the discussion or the motion made to opt out of the Family Act. And, um, that is what we will be on the agenda for our December meeting. So I have a question. Yes, sir. Why would we opt out of the Family Leave Act? Because our coverages are better than what the So that makes sense that uh, our firefighters also have. Yeah, our, our employees. That this would be, if we, if we did not opt out, then our uh, policy would be degraded. Correct. And there's an assist, well, there's an associated cost with it for one. Um, it's it's not free, obviously, um, and so we'd be paying for our current benefits package as well as this Family Leave Act, right? And it is not nearly as good as what we have now. So we have more generous family leave provisions. In Significantly our, better. Okay. Gotcha. 
Yeah, that's, I don't that's understand it that way, though, but this is like supplemental for critical care incidents that are longer term. <clears throat> and it's a pay-in option both for the employer, which would be us, mm -hmm. and, and also the employees. So employees, if we even opt out, employees can still opt in on their own. That's correct. That but it doesn't, correct, yes. it doesn't necessarily have to diminish what we currently offer in benefits. It's a supplement to that that's a pay into an insurance program. So that rather than being taking a long-term leave and not having any payment, they're being paid while they're there. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong in that assessment, but, and the big question for us really is notification and then getting some sense of, of whether the, the staff has any in, interest in it. And that's, that's the big thing. The big question is what, what the employees think of it. Um, we're, we'll have staff meeting and discuss and see wh where they want to go with it. Um, I think it's a point, I want to say 0.9% yeah. of salary. Yeah, for every employee. employee. And either the employee, the employer could do 0.45 and the employee right. do 0.95. Mm -hmm. But it does go into an insurance program. And it doesn't take effect until 2024, although we start paying in Yeah. So my, my understanding was similar to yours, I think, in that uh, it would augment any plan that is already in existence. It would, it's not an either or situation. It's a, it could be, if, if we opt into the program, it could be a both and. Yeah. So why would that not be beneficial to the firefighters? I don't just know. Just trying to understand. Well, so right now we cover 100% of firefighter right. benefits. I don't know how many of our employees would be amenable to paying anything, you know, because we pay all of their benefits right now. Um, I mean, that, and that's that's a discussion for it. Um, you know, there, there's there's a lot to learn. I, I just started unpacking as Melissa did. <laughs> this is more than the flyer I was emailed. <laughs> yes. Um, there's We're some really good sites on the the state's website. I've started I've started yeah. diving into it a lot more. Um, it is interesting to hear it, it it runs the gamut from people are completely opposed to it to people are 110 percent and you're failing your employees if you don't get on board with it. I got you. Um, okay. And so there there's a lot more I think research that we need to do with it to see how it worked, how it impacts our employees, and see if they're even interested in it. So and how many employees do we have? What's our total? Um, our permit full time is 34. So we're over the... And, you know, I don't know the other thing. I don't know if this is something that seasonal employees get. That's, that's another thing that... I, I don't know how that works because we have our seasonal workforce as well. And that's something that... There's a wage cap, if I remember right, for the entire year. That would, would okay. That triggers the qualification. Okay, then I, I haven't got to that like point. I was five thousand or something. Like that. Yeah, and I was trying to tinker, and our seasonals are going to be right in there. So I, I don't know. The seasonal component is going to be another thing that we have to figure out. I mean, it would be great to offer something to our seasonals. Yeah, and again, this is really just critical. I mean, this is you know, crisis kind of yeah. long term relief. It's so it it really is meant to be. Sort of a place where if you exhaust all of your leave, right. you, you've got this, and the, which is what the Family Mer Medical Leave Act is, the federal one, yeah. which is, does not necessarily pay, but gives you a right to stay in your job while yeah. you're in that as long as you claim family medical. And the, the difference here is that this adds the benefit of some payment through an insurance program that the state offers. So I, I, think, I think there's going to be a lot more to come on this. So um, the critical thing is that we need to get some posting <coughs> up for a notification to the employees. Exactly. Yeah. That so the key. and then continue this conversation. Well, I I need to build a flyer because it also has to have enough websites and enough background information so we can learn. Um, right. Because some of that can be done by mail as well. Or email to the staff. So. Yep. I'm I'm actually working on that now. Yeah. Um, yeah. It will get it emailed out to the staff. And this, then, the state site does have a lot of information on there. It's got a lot, yeah. It's got a lot of videos and yeah. presentations and so forth. 
So it says, unlike the Family Medical Leave Act, the new Colorado Family Requirement applies to employees of any size, public or private. And there are exceptions for participating. One is that employers provide leave through a private plan that meets or exceeds the requirements of family right. for local government employees denying to participate. So um, it's our belief that we meet or exceed, but the opportunity, even if we got out of it, they still have an opportunity. Correct, but it's, there is a question of whether we administer that or right. they have to do it completely on their own. And I guess my question, one of the things I need to see is whether or not uh, our leave actually does exceed, mm -hmm. or if this is a, a supplemental. And then I understand the aspect though of it is a it is a decrease in take home pay because mm -hmm. it's a it's a pay in. Right. So there will be more information on this to follow. All right, that takes us out of new business into citizens issue. Do we have any yeah. citizens issues tonight? Um, oh, I, ju I just have an awareness. Um, no, for you, uh, maybe you already know, but Inner Canyon had a special board meeting on consolidation, and they published uh, minutes. And one of the points Chief Sherlaw made was for consolidation to work, the new district would need 24 full-time rotating staff, and currently there are only eight. So right there, that's going out and telling the community, oh, we're going to have to increase staffing for consolidation to work. So just for an awareness situation, that's happening in Inner Canyon. So they said that Inner Canyon will have to increase from 8 to 24? Or are they he, saying he that said the new district as the whole would need 24 full-time rotating staff. Mm -hmm. Currently, there are only eight. Is that so anyway, that's... That sound right. that sound right. I was going to say, I don't know what this... What like eight you talking it, about? It's <clears throat> published on their website. So, yeah. I mean, as you guys know before, I'd suggest there's yeah. some... Sort of consolidated Talk message to, to the three. That's, thank you for pointing that out. Because yeah. well, uh, that, that's, I, I don't know who the eight is. That's not. But it's just, you know, when I hear this discussion, I look at what's being published, I'm sort of getting the impression that the mill levy's already decided. And, you know, wait, I mean, you know, it's like that's what's going to gonna pop out. And not that I wouldn't support it. But there may be other citizens looking at this saying, hmm. As being skewed. I see what you're saying. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Neil, you had something? Well, got it on my tongue ball. We were discussing consolidation until citizens' comments. But you mentioned one of the questions was, what district are you in? And does the Python know what district you're in? when they send it out, and they're just seeing if you know what district you're in. And um, I believe there was something called a dress wizard in the Jefferson County website or something. It used to be where you could look up your address and you would know what Senate House district you're in, Senate district, and Commissioner's district, and also I presume our protection district, and uh, maybe you could include a link in your survey to say if you don't know what district you're in, click on this and type in your address, and you'll know what district you're in. But, but I think, Neil, and, and I appreciate that, but I think part of the reason for asking that is to find out how aware the but citizens does, are. Will they try to know what district they're in, and how will they know if it's an anonymous reply if these people really? Do. I mean, they could say, well, I know I'm in Inner Canyon when they're really in Elk Creek. So they say, oh, yeah, I know I'm in it. And I've talked, you know, in the Mill Levy increase campaigns, you ask somebody, well, what district are you in? Well, oh, I'm in such and such, but pointed out on the map. Oh, well, no, you're not. So a lot of people think they know what district you're in, but they don't. Okay, we'll take that one. We'll take so, that uh, with um, thank you. Clark. Thank um, you. It's a question we should ask them. So, but yeah. I'd say, essentially, if they just take the list of eligible 
the electors for Elk Creek and say, well, we match this up with your emails, then they know they know where they sent these, but then when they get them back, how do they know whether these people really knew what these people were? Doing? So this would enable the respondents to know to check if they don't know. I don't I don't know. That seems and then the other responses you were given were all related to wildland fires. I would say that people who are 65 and older are more interested in ambulance. Mm -hmm. And there's questions on that as well. And, and yeah, there's, and there's also structure fires. Questions. So some people have bit rat and very different emphasis within the various services of this uh, of the fire, of the fire protection district. There's so one question that addresses demographics that, you know, that uh, talks about the age of the constituents in the area. It, it does address all the services. Okay. You know, yeah. wildland, EMS. I mean, those are just, you know, a few. It, it addresses wildland, EMS, technical rescue, structure, fire, you know, all, all the disciplines and all the, all the responses that we provide. And I also noticed in your response it said, implying that the Consolidation question said this coming if it was on the ballot this November, meaning I presume November 2023. So how does all of this consolidation questioning and effort tie in with the um, necessity of the um, sunset um, sunset extension? Or and that's what we're, we're we're trying to figure out exactly what that how that's going to look but we have to ask the question to figure out what the knowledge is so we can figure out how to move into the second phase so yes but i mean we we all Creek have to do something about the, the extension yep. regardless and that's on the radar and that's something that the chief as is well aware of and i do i feel um The whole question of tax increases, uh, and plus, I think the discussion. Well, do you want 14 mil, 14 mils, or this or that? It's kind of meaningless unless you can give. If this company has so much knowledge, they could also find out. Well, what is your mill levy of this? We know your mill levy. We're going to tell you or how much you pay on your taxes. Why not say? By the way, we happen to know that you're paying. $244.18. I Would think you like there is a question that's $275.18. Don't mm -hmm. you're sort of re referring it to some abstract mill levy? I would say convert it to their real dollars and cents of what they're paying in that as an individual. The company actually does have that. Um, so they but have. I, mean, I wouldn't ask 12.1 or 15.2, <clears throat> put it in real dollars that. These people are paying. They, well, that's yeah. the quantifiable part because nobody really knows what 12.4 mills means. So and it's meaningless to people. Well, but, in a way, other than no, well, we, it's higher. We, we it's can more. certainly take that. You know, we'll we'll make sure that the mills are listed out in terms of what the monetary value is. But I'm saying tie it to the actual person's mill levy of that house. Well, and we, that's a possibility. We can certainly talk to Turncourt about that. But because this is an if they know their street address, and they know, then they can tie that to the mill levy that they're paying. Okay. okay. Actual mill levy. What's your next issue? Well, also I have a suggestion here, um, or an idea that the. Um, there's going to be a new uh, Jefferson County, South Jefferson County Library, and that's going to be on uh, open space, uh, Sledding Hill Park, which is at the intersection of uh, Kipling Parkway and uh, Ken Carl Avenue in the northwest corner. And it's, it's about uh, 30 acres, and basically it's a fairly gentle hill in the Prairie Hill Colony. And uh, they are proposing um, the library district or wherever it is is proposing that uh, they take uh, five or six acres of that and build this $25 million library and uh, the uh, Jefferson County Library group has their own 
no levy, which was uh, raised and approved by the taxpayers. So uh, in this discussion of that, and it's completely surrounded by housing, so it's not, it's a kind of precious area in terms of open space. And then in the discussion of uh, this Jefferson County open space and this Proposal I saw it said uh, public utilities quote uh, quote historically um, have been accommodated by Jefferson County open space so I, I don't know if this I presume Elk Creek Fire Protection District is a public utility maybe not technically in the term but maybe that's what they were trying to get at and that my suggestion would be for you all to consider as a location of a new station taking some of the Meyer Ranch open space, not taking it, but purchasing some of the Meyer Ranch open space, or else exchanging it for the property Inner Canyon Station 3 and constructing a new station there. On presumably the north side, the same side that the Yellow House is on, because that was a big deal on the Sledding Hill Park thing, that they not destroy or as little as possible of the sledding activity. So right now it's sledding in Prairieville on the town. So I, I would say that based on that analysis, that the issue or idea of proposing a station there is, would not be a moot or dead question. That you could say, here's what's being done on other Jefferson County open space, and we could use five or six acres for a new station and that would place it within the Elk Creek, current Elk Creek Park Protection District. So I feel that's worth some exploration and you could use the rationale and discussions of all of this stuff that they built from the library and discussing um, use of that Jefferson County open space as a model for your basic argument so you could sort of build on that and that that could be a question to seriously consider. That's and a brilliant uh, idea, Neil. Yes, I'll tell you um, what, give us a little bit to work on that. That could be something that we could look at. So that's time. my suggestion but, that mm -hmm. um, basically go Google and yeah. library and um, Sledding Hill Park. All right, we're going to put that, that on the Chief's radar <laughs> for our long term. <clears throat> Actually, uh, Director Gary Barrett has did actually explore that chunk of dirt um, a number of years ago. So that, that's that's not the first time the term brought up. But it's prime because it has access to 285 and mm -hmm. there's going to be a problem at that station three in terms of left turns and, and Friday afternoons and nights and all this kind of stuff. So give us an opportunity to explore that a little further, find out where we got with the Director Barrett when he was working on that with Chief McLaughlin, and um, we'll uh, give us a little while. That's, we'll be able that's to. That's my suggestion. All right, yeah. thank you very much. Um, uh, as always, Neil, thank I'll you. Close up my and uh, sir, you had a question or comment? Yeah, we, I spoke with Chief Warner earlier. I think we're good. Um, okay. In, he actually had the question about the uh, bike park and he, oh, he was the individual. Right. Um, we yes, we so can address that here in the um, forum. Okay. This is somewhat old business, but just to clarify, that uh, we are still, there was a discussion in new business last week, last month, about um, the bike park inappropriately using some verbiage that says that we are um, in partnership with them when that is the furthest from the truth. And we are looking at it legally, and of course, anytime you involve um, a legal opinion it takes a period of time, so that is not a dead issue. And okay. we're still working on your attorneys to hurry up because I'm tired of looking at their website. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor told me not to do something <laughs> because I was doing it. <laughs> Quit going to the website. <laughs> all right. <coughs> Any other issues? All right. Thank you all very much. Um, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. November 10th, 2022, Board of Directors meeting. Second? Second. We'll call the uh, meeting adjourned at 734. Thank you all very much.